We will be getting started here in just a, uh, a couple moments. And uh, for those who have just joined, um, just to let you know that we are recording this and streaming it um, to our YouTube channel. So uh, um, this is being recorded. I will go ahead and get us started. Uh, as we have a few preliminaries to cover, and I'll give uh, other folks a continued chance to hop on. But uh, first off, I'd like to thank you all for joining us uh, for our second night of the Colorado TU Digital Rendezvous. Uh, I'm David Nickham, the Executive Director for Colorado Travel Unlimited. Uh, appreciate all of you uh, taking time from your evening to, uh, to take part in the session tonight. Um, uh, we're going to have a, a great program coming up, uh, and uh, it, as well as all of our rendezvous, is possible because of the generosity of our sponsors, and so we'd like to thank them, uh, Alpine Bank, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, Bright Water Engineers, and Freestone Aquatics uh, are our sponsors for the Digital Rendezvous. Uh, really appreciate their uh, helping make this possible and uh, particularly uh, their willingness to, to stick with us uh, in this unusual year as we uh, had to shift from an in-person spring event to a digital fall event. Uh, appreciated their standing by us and, and Hill and still lending their sponsorship and support to uh, making this event possible. Um, we have a, uh, from one of our sponsors, we'll be featuring just a very short video here uh, from uh, Coward Parks and Wildlife uh, to recognize them. And have you got that? So again, a, a big thank you to uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife for their support and uh, participation. Uh, you'll see one of our uh, panelists tonight is also with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And without further ado, why don't we get into the, uh, uh, the main event for tonight. Uh, um, we're very fortunate to have a, a panel that's being moderated by uh, Joel Johnson. Joel is the uh, co-founder uh, of Admirable Devil. It's an ad agency in Washington, D.C. Uh, earlier in his career, he was the um, chief marketing officer for Trout Unlimited, where he uh, uh, launched a, a real national content strategy, including uh, establishing the Wild Steelhead United campaign in, uh, for conservation of wild steelhead populations in the Northwest United States. He is an editor at large for Angling Trade Magazine and uh, is a regular uh, participant with Orvis Podcasts, uh, with Tom Rosenbauer, and at the, the IFTD trade shows. So good chance some of you have met him or seen him before. We're honored to have him tonight to lead our session on um, uh, centering Black and Indigenous people of color in conservation and angling. Joel. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, David. And thank you to Colorado TU 
and to the Colorado Parks and Wildlife and all the sponsors for the 2020 Digital Rendezvous. Um, my name is Joel Johnson. It is a um, honor and a pleasure to be here with you this evening virtually. Um, I am zooming in from Washington, DC, uh, not in Colorado. I unfortunately have not been in Colorado for several months because of the pandemic, but I am often out there, usually three, four, sometimes five times a year um, with uh, quite a lot of friends um, to fish um, and to uh, enjoy the great state of Colorado. Um, David Nickham reached out to me uh, earlier this year to talk about um, speaking with you all and developing a uh, panel so that we could have a robust conservation about uh, the presence and centering of Black, Indigenous, and people of color in conservation. And um, in our chat, we discussed and realized that it would be very critical to have um, Colorado voices uh, from all walks of life um, as part of the panel to discuss uh, the importance of um, increasing the centering and um, presence of people of color in conservation. Um, against the backdrop of the great work of Trout Unlimited in Colorado, uh, which involves obviously conservation education at many different levels through um, both the chapters and the state level, um, as well as outreach, um, we thought it would, it would be important to have a diverse group of panelists that represented both um, folks who had come up through to you as volunteers um, and as well as folks who work outside of TU to provide um, outdoor education and conservation education. And then at the, uh, let's call it the state level or the regulatory level um, to have voices talk about the larger efforts going on within the state. So um, we're really looking forward to um, the panel this evening. We'll probably wrap up, uh, let's see, it's seven o'clock your guys' time. We'll probably wrap up at about 8.30. We'll try to aim for about an hour and a half and leave plenty of time um, for some Q&A. Uh, we will take your questions hopefully through the actual chat uh, mechanism on your Zoom. And that way we can kind of moderate it and try to get to as many of those questions as possible. Um, and if you'll hold on your questions until the end, that will be great. Um, but feel free to send your applause to any points um, or support for any points for the panelists. Um, in the chat. Okay, um, a couple of things just to start us off in terms of how we'll do the run of show for this evening. I would like to spend a little bit of time sort of giving you all a keynote uh, prior to jumping into the panel that will hopefully lay some context and understanding for um, the background to this panel and to what is really, you know, a kind of a, an interesting and very important moment in conservation uh, right now. Um, I think it goes without saying that we first have to acknowledge a few things. Let's start with acknowledging this evening that not only is Colorado, um, the Rocky Mountain West and the United States going through a very, very challenging time um, as we deal with a global pandemic in COVID-19, but we are also going through a time where there is a great opportunity to pause and to reflect on our footprint on this planet. Um, a number of um, scientists have pointed out that um, the danger of COVID-19 really comes from a number of impacts on the planet and the way in which we treat our natural environment um, that can create opportunities for diseases to pass from uh, the natural world and wildlife to the human species. And, you know, this has raised a kind of alarm in the uh, scientific community. And, you know, when we think more broadly, culturally, about how we 
as Americans process these things, obviously there are the terrible effects of COVID-19, but then there is also the opportunity to pause and reflect about where we are in our relationship to the natural world and the unbound and unchecked effects of climate change, um, no doubt have a role to play. So as we think about this conversation, while well, we're gonna take it all the way down to the granular level, of talking about black and indigenous and people of color and conservation and how we, as those folks engage with conservation, I think there is a larger tableau, a larger macro world to think about. Secondly, I think one of the impacts of the pandemic has been that in this great pause, if you will, it has given all of us a time and an opportunity and a chance to spend more time with family, with friends, the people we care about in the great outdoors because outside, properly socially distanced, we can spend time together, we can socialize, we can be out in the natural environment, hiking, fishing, biking, walking, even if it's just a good old fashioned backyard barbecue, again, properly social distanced, the outdoors has always been, but creates an opportunity to connect us, to reconnect us in a time when we're separated from our colleagues at work and family across the country by the pandemic. Thirdly, this has been a monumentous six or seven months of change. And in it, we're seeing a number of long simmering issues in the culture of our country rise to the top. The summer, the murder and the death of George Floyd sparked nationwide protests. These protests were not simply populated by African-Americans or people of color in our urban core. But you could see them all over the country, even in small rural towns and across the United States, full of all different kinds of people, young, old, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, people from the left, people from the right. Everyone felt something in this summer's reaction to that murder. And so there has been a national conversation in the last few months about how the United States reckons with its troubled history and past and its issues around systematic racism. And what we found is that those conversations that are being had are being had everywhere, not just at work, not just in our schools or hospitals or the boardrooms, but even outside when we're fishing, even outside when we're hiking, even outside when we're at the backyard barbecue. The reality is, is we don't live in a world full of compartments. We live in a world where everything affects us. And while some of us head to the woods and head to the streams to find a kind of peace, or a sense of escape, if you will, from the troubles of the world. If you're a black indigenous person or person of color, you oftentimes don't leave those troubles behind. So <clears throat> against those difficult backdrops, there is a lot of really wonderful great news about the growing interest and activation of people of color Black people and indigenous people in conservation. And it starts with recognizing two things. One, these communities have actually always been a part of conservation, but in many ways, they do it outside of the mainstream media and outside the eye of the mainstream within our own communities. Two, these communities actually have always worked in a very complex way. We often do not separate conservation from equity and social justice. And that's because in a country that has faced a long and troubling history of systemic racism, environmental justice is often the entryway uh, for the con con conversation around conservation amongst people of color. 
If you look at our environment, you will see there is a disproportionate, and I say a, a disproportionate amount of negative conservation, uh, I'm sorry, negative environmental effects on people of color. There are more incinerators, there are more um, refuse centers, there are more, um, uh, there's more pollution, um, and there are more sites that have been degraded so terribly around people of color, around black people, and around indigenous communities than most people suspect. We basically look at conservation as not just a connection between a kind of mythical far off natural world or a place that we have to get into our car to reach or a place where we can bury all our troubles, but we really look out our front doors and we see the world around us. So <clears throat> the good news is, is that having that close proximity to the dire impacts and effects of a changing world, a warming climate, and also to disproportionate environmental degradations, you can have a kind of reaction. And in that reaction, there comes a sense that these are, conservation is very personal, that it's very real, and that it impacts all of us. Now, when you think about conservation of the type that an organization like the Sierra Club or Trout Unlimited does, you get an interesting opportunity to think about specific species and specific locations like cold water conservation, which obviously focuses up from the headwaters all the way down to the bays and the, and the uh, estuaries where um, trout and salmon um, that uh, migrate and pass through. And along the way, uh, uh, in that journey, those fish pass communities of color. And those communities of color, depending on where they are and how long they've been established, have a relationship with those waters and those fish. So when we think about the conservation that black and indigenous and people of color do, I think it's important to ground it in the reality that it isn't simply about protecting an opportunity to be outside or protecting an opportunity to create, for example, better fishing, if angling happens to be your way in to conservation. It's really about taking one's whole self. And when I say whole self, I mean both our sort of spiritual selves, our social selves, our cultural selves, and finding a connection to the environment around us and through the communities that we live and work in. There are numerous, numerous, numerous groups of conservationists spread across different fields, both from the conservation of cold water um, and species-based conservation across the United States that are diverse groups that are made up of people of color at all levels, from the board and executive level, all the way through to the volunteers. However, organizations like Trout Unlimited have, uh, Unlimited have historically not included black, indigenous, and people of color. Now there's a lot of reasons why, and one could argue it works on a chapter chapter level, even at a state level. But this is because in many ways, the larger conservation community has not really found a way to connect with us or to approach black and indigenous and people of color in a more collective and complex and comprehensive manner, understanding that our understanding of conservation is a little more multivalent. So the opportunity is to begin to have conversations like this, where folks like Howard and Elon and Emma and myself 
share our experiences with organizations like Colorado TU and other national conservation organizations, and even the industry that helps support the access opportunities in outdoor recreation, and then to share our points of view, to share our thinking, to share our ideas, to share how we work with each other to create conservation outcomes that are positive. So that's really the point of this conversation tonight is to give you an introduction to ourselves and also to share how in our work, both professionally as educators, outreach coordinators and volunteers, our lives are somewhat different, but absolutely uh, can be as dedicated, if not um, more to conservation once we uh, find a common ground and a way to understand how black and indigenous and people of color approach conservation. So with that being said, what I'd like to do is um, open up uh, a panel and unmute Howard and Elon and Emma and introduce them. And once we share a little bit and find out a little bit more about them, to ask them some questions about their experiences and kind of begin to have a conversation about centering Black and Indigenous and people of color in conservation. All right, I think we are unmuted, great. So let me start with some introductions. <clears throat> Howard Horton is the Organizational Development Coordinator for the Colorado Parks and Wildlife System. Howard was born on the Western Slope of Colorado and grew up hiking in the deserts, looking at Native American ruins, floating rivers with his family and his friends along the San Juan Mountains. There he also hunted deer and elk and fished. Howard is now married to Megan and has two daughters, Lila and Ilya, who love being outside and playing in nature. Howard has worked for Colorado Parks and Wildlife for over 14 years as a game warden as an angler education out, uh, coordinator, and is now working on organizational development and leadership programs, including employee development engagement and diversity, equity, and, initi uh, and inclusion, inclusive, inclusion initiatives, excuse me. Elon Stribling, who's also joining us tonight, is a wildlife biologist who formerly worked with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. He is an outdoor educator, and he was born and raised in Denver. For him, conservation and equality go hand in hand. When he's not fly fishing, Elon can be found watching comedy shows all around the Denver area. And if you're lucky, you might have been able to see Elon do his own stand up as a comedian. If not, I encourage you to catch one of his shows. Emma, who I'm sure many of you know, is an avid angler and very passionate conservationist and currently a pre-medical student at Colorado University in Boulder. She's worked with Colorado TU for five years in a number of different roles. And she began that activity when she was just 16 years old. <clears throat> she recently worked on last year's rendezvous and including the Colorado TU anniversary film Decades. And she is, can be found volunteering and working on behind the scenes on a number of projects with the Mayfly Project, the Greenbacks, and many other Colorado TU chapters, including the Stream Girls, as an advocate, <clears throat> and, uh, as an advocate and engaging youth in conservation through fly fishing. So I'd like to welcome our panelists to the conversation and uh, begin the conversation by opening it up with uh, and asking each one of, of our panelists to just share with us um, when was the last time they got out to go fishing? Um, I'll start. Hello, everyone. My name is Elon Stribling. Uh, the last time I got out to go fishing was actually yesterday. I got to sneak away for uh, most of the day and, and explore some new water. So 
Um, it was a it was a good day. I love the the fall color. So lucky man, lucky man. Emma. Um, I sorry, I can't see anyone. I can only see myself and whoever's talking. Um, so I probably went fishing like three months ago. So <sighs> I'm stuck inside in school. So oh, sorry. I know. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> The last time I was able to go out fishing uh, for myself, I should say, um, was on my birthday, late July. Um, I went up to see a friend in South Park and just fished you know, a little bitty trout stream full of little beaver ponds, you know, wet wading, full of mud and sticks. And I, I think the biggest fish I caught of the day was maybe eight inches, but just a great day of walking water and, you know, flipping flies at fish. Fantastic. Nothing like fishing little beaver ponds. Uh, the last time I got out to fish, it was for smallmouth bass on the Shenandoah River here about a month ago, but things have pretty much slowed down. But uh, I do have to say, uh, I really do miss being in Colorado um, and uh, fishing for trout. Not to say that we don't have trout here, there's plenty of them. It's just, you know, the Shenandoah River is pretty close by and it's a great opportunity. All right, so as a follow-up question to that, when was the last time you got out to fish with another person of color? Mm. Oh, I, uh, I guess I'll start again. <laughs> I'll, uh, I got out with my friend, uh, Bianca, who used to work for Trout Unlimited, um, but that was about, that was about a month ago or so, maybe two months. Um, so uh, fairly, I mean, not super recently, but about a month ago, um, we got out and got into some fish or tried. Uh, for me, like, I don't even know. I don't even know if I've gone fishing with, like recently with another person of color. Um, I do have a professor who fishes um, and she's a Spanish teacher. So I got to go fishing with her like six months ago, but a long time ago. Oh. Yep. I think probably the last time I was able to go uh, fishing with somebody of, you know, different color or ethnic diversity was probably in my, my former role um, would have been this winter doing ice fishing clinics. Um, you know, I know we had some pretty good mixed groups that were out there on the lake with me, teaching them how to catch fish through the ice for the first time. But um, to be honest, there was ice fishing, then there was summer, then COVID Groundhog Day. I don't really remember what happened. It just did the same thing over and over and over. And then uh, I did that fishing on my birthday, and then that's been about it. So, yeah, it's tough right now. I mean, there have, be, you know, we've been one, we've got more time to go potentially in some cases, but. Uh, at the same time, the opportunities still seem slim with all the things that are going on in our lives. Um, I recently had a chance to fish with um, uh, someone named DJ here in the DC area. Uh, I mentioned I went smallmouth bass fishing and um, DJ uh, and I went fishing together and it was the first time we actually met and it was the first time we um, ever fished together. Um, we actually had spent some time talking a little bit on the phone. DJ reached out to me um, because we were following each other on Instagram. And what I have been doing, and I would say the last five years has been using social media to sort of broaden my own community um, of people who share with me, uh, who share a passion for the outdoors and for fly fishing. Um, and it was a wonderful um, day spent fishing, but um, it's just really remarkable when you think about it, that um, somebody you don't know or don't have a relationship with, you can have a shared passion and find each other and go fishing. And I think one of the reasons why um, DJ and I decided to go fishing is we were both very excited to see that there were, you know, um, other black anglers, particularly fly anglers in the Washington, D.C. area. And one of the things I've noticed is, um, you know, 
social media creating a large impression, perhaps, if you will, that there are more people of color fishing. I wonder if you guys have noticed that or if you feel, and if you feel that's true, or is this a sort of, you know, the world of social media versus IRL in real life and that the two are very different? No, I've, uh, I've definitely experienced that through social media, especially through Instagram and stuff like Facebook groups um, that although, although um, I may not see someone who looks like me or, or just someone who isn't uh, sort of cookie cutter, uh, I've definitely found them on Instagram and was able to kind of just connect through um, shared experiences or just just fly fishing as a, as a fundamental basis for relationships. So definitely through Instagram and I've done the same thing, Joel, like we fished last year um, and I've done the same thing where I've, you know, seen someone or messaged people and been like, hey, do you want to go out um, and fish? And it's just, uh, it's, yeah, it's nice, but I've definitely seen through Instagram finding groups of people or, or finding organizations that kind of help uh, um, push push people to get more outdoors and, and build relationships and connections, so. Yeah, I would agree. I think social media gives a narrative that you don't commonly see, especially with groups, um, perhaps like CTU or, um, you know, maybe big companies and organizations like Cabela's um, who are very, have like a large presence. Um, and social media, especially for young people, allows us to have a space and a way of communicating to get together and fish or to go hiking or to just create a group where you can talk about things that you have in common. Um, I think that, yeah, that's really important to have. Yeah, you know, I mean, I guess kind of filling in my role a little bit here of, uh, you know, the patch, the state agency and stuff. I know it's been a focus of ours for quite a while to, you know, show a more complete picture of anglers in Colorado. Um, and so, you know, not saying that, oh, there's always been, but there, there are, there's always been a lot, but there's always been anglers of, you know, all colors and genders and everything else that you can, you know, diversity you want to label it with um, out there. And, and I think it's high time that agencies like ours are, are starting to put that image out there more often you know it's kind of a responsibility i feel like that we have to 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 show that and uh we're we're you know behind but we're doing better and we're, we're starting to kind of show that more so i do think it's there you know especially here in, in colorado in the southwest and that um you know there's been such a large hispanic latino latinx population community around for so so long um that you know they, there's been hunting and angling in that community for a long time, you know, I grew up in it and stuff. So it, it was there, but it just, yeah, you didn't see it, I guess, in mass media or, or other places as commonly. So I don't think that it's um, not real that it's there. I mm -hmm. think it's just the agency's doing a better job of, of trying to better represent the makeup of the state. So. Hmm. Thank you for that. You know, I, I, I think that um, that reminds me of, uh, of something. When I was um, the chief marketing officer at Trout Unlimited, I was there for about three and a half years. Um, I think, it, I can't remember if it was Kirk Dieter or Chris Wood, but somebody there used to say, um, fishing is like the front door, right? Uh, to conservation for our organization. And um, I thought, wow, you know, that makes a ton of sense, right? It, you know, if you, if you are somebody who cares about angling, you know, and you go out and you buy a rod, you know, let's say at Orvis and you get a, a membership, an Orvis free, you know, TU membership in that rod case, you know, that might be the first exposure you ever have to an organization like TU. Unless of course you have a family member or a friend who's already a member and maybe you follow, you know, you know, you've connected to TU through that group. Um, and that, in that case, it might be because it's purely understanding that you want to protect it, you know, or, or be an advocate for cold water resources around you. Um, anyway, we used to say fishing is the front door. And I remember saying, well, 
if fishing is the front door, who gets to walk into the house, you know? And I had an opportunity to travel all across the country, visiting uh, chapters and state organizations um, and spend time with folks, both working on helping them to tell the story of the major conservation projects they were working on, um, helping them to reach out to folks and do, and, and to kind of grow, frankly. And I kept always being sort of um, in the first year or so sort of stunned by kind of how overwhelmingly white the organization was as well as overwhelmingly male. Um, and then, but more importantly, perhaps overwhelmingly older, you know, and of course this just sort of reflects to a certain degree um, some of the demographics around say fly fishing, which is uh, a territory, not the only, but a territory in which uh, Trout, Unlimited draw, Trout Unlimited draws a lot of its memberships because of fly anglers, you know, connection to that cold, those cold water fisheries. But um, I used to always ask myself, you know, well, I mean, I've fallen in love with trout. <laughs> I mean, I've fallen in love with brook trout. I've fallen in love with, you know, brown trout. And I've fallen in love with these beautiful spaces where these, these wild animals exist. You know, um, I've been lucky enough to connect to them, to these spaces. Why can't or why hasn't more people of color, you know, connected to these spaces? And partly, I think I sort of had a realization that the old reasons and the myths that I used to tell myself, or even that the organization told itself, weren't always true. One would be, would be well, there's not enough people of color fishing, right? Which, you know, is simply not true. Um, you know, the numbers just don't bear that out. There are plenty of people of color fishing. Um, I thought, well, is there not enough people of color outside, you know? And the numbers don't bear that out either. There's plenty of people outside doing outdoor activities. Well, are there not enough people of color in conservation or who care about the environment? The numbers kind of don't bear out maybe the latter part. Maybe there are definitely not enough people of color in conservation, but there are certainly enough people of color who care about conservation. So is it just two communities of people that just have not talked to each other, have not connected, you know, have not found a common ground or um, a path to connect? You know, I think about where my first love of conservation came when, when I was a young person, just learning how to fish um, on the banks of Lake Erie. That's where I first sort of found my connection to the natural world and wanting to care about it. So I wonder what you all think about whether or not or how people of color find their way to organizations like TU, other similar kinds of conservation organizations, um, and whether you think, you know, they, they might, what might be the best way in which they might find an organization like, like a TU? Um, yeah, and I, uh, I agree with everything. And I think um, when I grew up fishing, fishing for me from one of my grandfathers um, was waking up at three or four o'clock in the morning and getting in his truck and putting all the bait and stuff and driving to a lake to get a spot and then just sitting there for the next six, seven hours and just waiting to catch a fish. Um, so that's kind of what I grew up with the idea of, of fishing and um, didn't really, you know, fall in love with it or even know what fly fishing was until I got to college. Um, and there was like a, like a Saturday morning, like a, you know, come tie fly sort of event. Um, and that's when I really, I didn't even know really what fly fishing was then. So um, I don't, I don't think it's, you know, black folks or people of color not getting outside or not being in conservation. I think it's, um, yeah, it's, you, you know, you can't be what you can't see. I think a lot of people don't even think fishing or fly fishing or anything in the outdoors is, uh, is something worth um, spending, you know, time on or, or being uh, enjoyable or, or uh, the money thing, I think is a big thing. Cause if you are renting gear, or if you go to a uh, fly shop gear it can be pretty expensive. Um, and that's just for, you know, person of color or just anyone who wants to get into it may, may see the cost. So um, I don't remember what your question was, 
<laughs> well, no, I, I think we're kind of gone around it a bit, but I mean, ultimately I was thinking about, um, you know, what might be those first connections to an organization like Trout Unlimited for somebody, you know, for a person of color who does care about um, uh, the environment and maybe has a connection to, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, cold water fisheries, right? So thinking about the Pacific Northwest, thinking about the upper Northeast and the Rocky Mountain West and, and fr frankly, you know, even down in the Southeast and, and um, where there are um, dozens of cold water fisheries, you know, that do connect or pass through populations of people of color. I'm thinking of say like the, Chatt the Chattahoochee River in a place like Atlanta, right? Um, I think you bring up something really interesting, Elon, which is, is that, you know, part of it is this fly fishing thing versus this larger fishing thing, right? You know, which is, is that you can't be what you can't see and fly fishing historically has just been a sport practiced mostly by white males and obviously, you know, outside of the sight of people of color. So if that's a place that TU is doing all their recruitment and having all their conversations around conservation, naturally people of color are not gonna be present there. But I'm curious, um, Emma, you have been a volunteer with TU since you were a teenager. I mean, if you could share with us like how that happened and you know, was it um, random or was it planned or what your experience was like, I think it would be interesting to hear that. Yeah, so I mean, you said it, I was 16 when I first started volunteering. I think I had just gotten my driver's license. And um, because of that, I had my fishing license before, you know, you can get your fishing license before you get your driver's license. Um, so I would always make my dad take me to a river and just drop me off. And I would try to like, get on the learning curve of, you know, teaching yourself how to fish. But um, after a while, so I was 16, 15, 16 in 2015. And it was right after the flood. So I live in Boulder County, Longmont area. And a lot of our rivers were damaged because of that. Um, and so I saw the effects of like not being able to fish, you know, some of the rivers that were close to home. And for me, since I couldn't drive, I had to go wherever my dad would take me, right? Because I couldn't drive. Um, and that those were the rivers that were affected the most by the flood. So that was kind of my introduction of like, oh, I, you know, the rivers that I fish are affected by the way that we treat them. Um, and that's what got me into kind of thinking about what can I take a step further in fishing, right? I've, I've gone through the door of learning how to fish and being outside for afternoons, but what can I do to help a community more and to hopefully be able to fish those rivers more, right? I think that's a pretty common um, like conservation introduction. Um, and from there, I had to graduate high school some way of, um, of doing like a senior project. Um, and I was like, what can I do <laughs> that I love? Um, cause we had to do like 200 hours of something. And so I decided fishing and conservation cause I get to fish. I get to learn about conservation. Um, and, and I already knew how to fish. So it wasn't really scary to go into it. I think to go into conservation per se, I think, if you don't have someone to look up to, it's kind of hard to go into an organization like CTU. Um, but I had the excuse of like, I need to graduate high school. <laughs> so I reached out to CTU. I got referred to the Greenbacks, which is a affiliated group, not necessarily a chapter. And then I started volunteering with them um, and directly started working with youth and um, teaching kids to fly fish who were my same age, so who were also in high school, but yet I was teaching them. So that was a really cool opportunity. And I started to see kind of the complex dynamic of how social media really affects um, like urban youth. Um, and if they see someone that looks like them, or if they see just something cool in the mountains or outside, that's something that they've probably never experienced before but it's very inspiring right like social media is something and a place where you can be very creative um, and those kids always love to see pictures of fish like we all love that we love seeing big fish um, out in the Rocky Mountains and they really love that too so that it kind of got them excited to go out and um, I would say that once that's like 
that's an access to conservation. That's like a route you can take. So, um, so I, so like many of us have fly fishing to conservation. That's the step. And for a lot of the kids who live, you know, in inner city Denver, um, social media is like the door for them. Mm. Um, so social media bridge to fishing bridge to conservation. That's just what I've seen in the age range of like 15 to 18. Um, so yeah, that's what I, that's my story. <laughs> oh, that's very, um, very interesting. Thank you for sharing yeah, that. And, thank you. You know, and I think you, you bring up a, I think all of you have brought up a, a good point, which is you almost need, you, we need to see it, right? To see what the possibilities are in order to know what they are and find our way to an organization like TU to see, you know, what, you know, how you can potentially connect to conservation. Um, Howard, I mean, I think I have a question for you around this because in a way, you know, you've been charged for many years with going out and educating young people and, and, and very directly, you know, you know, almost having like a, a, a metric around it, right? We need to create so many kinds of people who understand conservation um, and, and our environment here in Colorado. How, you know, how does, what role does the um, uh, CPW play in, I guess, specifically educating um, young people and people of color about conservation? And what are some of the basic techniques? I think it probably can't always all be fishing, right? Um, I'd be curious to get your perspective on that. Yeah, um, I, I mean, CPW, um, to me has a huge role in all of that. Um, it's clearly important to my agency um, as well as all the other agencies. That's why they had positions like the one I had of a angler education coordinator or angling coordinator of some sort. You know, almost every state has that, that kind of position. They see that value, um, you know, to use not as eloquent a term as what you use as the front door, but, you know, I used to refer to fishing as the gateway drug, right? It led to everything else that our agency did, camping, hunting, hiking, you name it. Um, it was a real common way. Um, you know, I think the only thing that, that has more impact or more success in getting people into outdoors and engaging with it is probably hiking slash walking, however you want to call that. That's the only other thing that even comes close Mm -hmm. uh, and it, that's probably far surpasses fishing. Um, but you know, it's one of those things where as an agency, it's, it's a, it's a critical mission for us, um, in that, how do we do that? How do we engage? And you know, I was thinking about your kind of question to, to Emma and Eland, and, you know, I, I think it's, it kind of varies a little bit in that like there's all these great stories of people who like, I mean, Emma was like self-motivated, amazing. I'm going to just do this, right? And Elon had this awesome, you know, grandfather and that took him out. And same with me, like I had my uh, parents had always took me out, right? And I didn't know it at the time, but there was conservation right there, right? Of, of not only were we going fishing and there was all the, you know, licenses and everything with that, but every time we went somewhere, right? Mom gave me a bag at the end and she said, go around and pick up all the trash you can find where we're at. We'll leave the place cleaner than we found it. And that's just, was routine. I didn't realize at the time that that was helping to, you know, instill that idea and that ethic and, and stuff in there. And so there's that aspect. And then, but, you know, I, I think that's, how, how do you get to the people who didn't have that? How do you get to the, the, the people who, for whatever reason, didn't have, you know, people that were in their life that showed them hunting or fishing, you know? Um, I, I think that's the real, the real trick and the real the real challenge on a lot of stuff. Um, and, and I, you know, I don't, I don't know that anybody has the one answer because if they did, everybody would be doing it. But yeah. one thing that I can say that I I've seen work and I know, well, one, right. It sells itself. If you can get somebody out there into the outdoors to experience nature, um, whether that's just to like be in the woods for the first time or on a creek or even in a little local pond or park that they didn't know was there and you get to you know hear the water and and just kind of maybe see insects or stuff in the water for the first time you know things like that that, that those things can be life-changing for people and I've seen it firsthand 
um, time and time again. And it didn't, they didn't have, they could be six or they could be 96. Either way, the smile on their face, the things they enjoyed, it was all the same. It was still there. So, you know, I think for an organization like TU, organizations like Colorado Parks and Wildlife, a real key thing is, is because they're not, people of color um, are not coming to us in large numbers just on their own. So how do we get them, right? Well, to me, I think one of the most successful ways is if you can find somebody, a champion, an Emma, an Eland, um, somebody in the community that's already has groups of people that they're working with. Maybe it's a church, maybe it's, um, you know, just a local organizer of, of maybe it's like a YMCA or just a, maybe it's a local coach or something like that, that, um, or maybe there's a local person that takes people that, that everybody knows goes hunting and fishing or, or goes fishing, does whatever. If you can find those people and engage with them, partner with them, get them because they have the trust in that community to bring the people. And then organizations like TU and, and Colorado Parks and Wildlife, we have the resources and the means to outfit them and get them set up and get them started and show them how to do it and how to do it right and what it means and, and those kind of things. And I think that's the real, the real, real key. You know, if you think about it, it only takes one generation of somebody not taking their immediate family, their kids, their nephew, their cousin, their sister out fishing for that to be lost. Yeah. Yeah. And so having to then reboot, you know, and so trying to find people that way, I think is just, it's just huge. So hmm. I don't know no, if I kind of answered your question, but I kind of, Oh, that's, you know, that's thinking about a lot of stuff. That's, that's brilliant, Howard. Thank you so much. I mean, I think there's um, just to unpack a little bit of what we've just been talking about for the last 15 minutes, there's, three, four great lessons there for all of us to take away in both our individual work and then also for those folks who are, who are watching this panel, um, just, to, just to kind of unpack a few things. Um, you know, one, uh, there's a family connection that it comes down to, you know, learning fishing and, let, and creating opportunities that you can tap into. Um, like any other culture, people of color, you know, are very community oriented and we learn to fish and we learn our connection to the outdoors through older family members, right? Um, certainly when we think about um, the makeup of, you know, although it's shifting, but on a national level, the makeup of the leadership of TU, we have lots of grandparents and grandmothers, uh, great aunts and great uncles and things like that in the leadership positions um, around the organization. And, um, you know, it seems like there may be an opportunity to reach out to older networks, um, specifically within your network, finding people of color who have an interest um, in fishing and talking about creating some intergenerational opportunities to learn to fish, using that as a front door to get into conservation. Um, another thing that Emma said, which I think was really powerful, was to understand that there's a difference between, you know, um, a young person of color learning or connecting to the outdoors or um, learning to fish, you know, whether they're in an urban environment or whether they're, you know, more closely, um, you know, more closely connected to that, that cold water fishery. And maybe the connection point specifically for young people is through more representation, being able to see the power of fishing through social media, being able to have fun and imagine themselves and visualize themselves as taking part in that, in that, in the sport. And obviously if we can get them into the sport, we can kind of create avenues to, to educate them about conservation. And maybe that's a pathway to an organization like TU or some other organization. Um, and then I think Howard, you know, you've shared with us a number of really good, good nuggets there. Um, I think one of them that, you know, just to, to pick out one that really resonated for me was the idea of finding um, these well-placed influencers in communities of color who may be leaders of various aspects of a community. It could be in the church, right? Part of the community. It could be in the, some other civic connection, a boys club leader, a girls club leader, something like that, boy scout, girl scout leader, um, who works already within a community of color and then finding a way to connect to them through the passion of conservation or some outdoor passion like fishing, fishing really being a, the big driver, as you said, um, and then creating that opportunity to, to, to 
almost create a liaison, right? You know, a conduit through to another community that clearly has credibility, authenticity, and understands perhaps how that community wants to connect and how they want to, how they want to, how they want to connect. Um, I, I find that um, in my experience with an organization like TU, really understanding how a community wants to connect is, is, is really critical to how successful you'll be. And um, finding, you know, and every community is, is different, right? Every community is different, but finding out how and on what, what grounds that community wants to have a conversation about con conservation really makes sense. In some cases, it may be, you know, not at all about the fishing, but about, about the health of the fishery that is, you know, um, running through their town or by their town and they know their kids are in, the, in those waters, right? And if there's obviously an abandoned mine in the headwaters, you know, you don't want, you know, you don't want your kids playing in the water downstream, right? So just understanding different ways to um, uh, respect that every community might have a different path or a different way um, to, to value those fisheries around them and therefore find a way to conservation seems to be um, um, a potentially a good path forward. Um, I'll share with you just a little story before asking the next question. Um, in the Washington DC area, it's absolutely incredible how much water we're surrounded by. There's the Chesapeake uh, Bay, there's the Anacostia River, and there's the Potomac River. And in many ways, Washington DC is just a little peninsula surrounded by water. I cannot tell you how often I have met people who have never fished, never been in a boat, never put their feet in the river, um, who only see the river as something to get over with <laughs> to get to the other side. And these rivers absolutely surround this community. Um, a few years ago, um, some of the leadership at TU connected with, uh, in, in, at the headquarters in Arlington, connected with um, a um, charter school that was focused on young black students um, and it was all male. And the point of it was to give those, those young men role models. And so the teachers and the principals were role models and so forth. But um, I don't know exactly how the connection happened, but somehow we were all going to take them fishing. And I remember our CEO, Chris Wood, um, coming over and asking me, would I come out and take these boys fishing? And I was like, absolutely. I mean, if I was a 16 year old kid in growing up in inner city Cleveland, like the way I did, and somebody said, here's a chance to do something new, I would jump at it. Anyway, I don't know how much choice these boys had, but they were all on uh, um, uh, rowboats in Fletcher's Cove in the Potomac and terrified of the water. Um, many of them wearing their really expensive sneakers and had no idea how to dress for the moment, you know, or what they would be doing. And it was the shad run uh, going on. So there was ample opportunities to fish and catch a fish. All you had to do was get that line down into the water and that fly. And uh, I will never forget the first kid who caught a, a fish screamed, bloody murder, just screamed, had no idea what to do with it. And all of his boys who were surrounding him laughing. And then next thing you know, they were catching fish and just the amount of energy, the sense of release, the amount of fun that they were having together. It was a first as an experience for them in many, many different ways. Um, but what was really interesting is getting off the water with them and asking them, did they like it? Did they enjoy it? Would they do it again? And not one of them said they were never coming back. They were like, I'm going to cut my mama. I'm going to call my, I want to go buy a rod. They just, they, they were like, how can I get back out here to have this much fun again? Uh, and they wanted to do it together. And so it just reminded me of the power of um, creating those first opportunities and those first connections. And you're right, Howard, you bring up a great point. You know, the CPW and TU has tremendous resources if we can just find a way to ally those resources with these opportunities. All right, um, I think that's one way of thinking about sort of membership-based organizations. But a lot of the point of this conversation was also to share ways in which people of color are also sort of centering themselves in conservation and creating opportunities. Um, Ilan, I know that you are an ambassador for Brown Folks Fishing, um, which is a national grassroots organization focused on creating greater representation um, in fishing. 
And I know that ultimately there is a conservation goal uh, connected um, with that work. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. And then also um, you are, or have recently been doing some education outreach with the Lincoln Hills Cares organization. Um, and I was wondering if you could share some of your experiences in doing some of that work. Yes, thank you. Um, so Brown Folks Fishing yes, we're a, is we're is a is an organization, a group of um, people who our main goal is to create a community where uh, people of color feel safe to ask questions about. It doesn't even have to be fly fishing, just angling in general, um, sort of outdoor recreation, and then uh, uh, holding people and and, and companies and organizations accountable for showing representation um, on the water as kind of as well as their um, boards and director positions. Uh, yeah, and we're we're doing an angling for all pledge, uh, which is where uh, big name brand organizations can um, commit to having people of color on um, on their board or, or show more representation through avenues like that. Um, as well as we're doing, a, um, I can't remember the name of it right now, but we're doing a, a, a program where um, we have like mentors and mentees. Um, so to kind of uh, cultivate a, uh, an environment of asking questions and not being afraid of um, someone scowling you or someone over explaining something that you already knew or, or things like that. So um, I do love my, my brown folks fishing family and everyone in there is, is sweetheart and open. And I've, I've met a few of them because we're all kind of over um, all around the country. So um, yeah, BFF is, is a great something to be a part of. And once again, it happened organically through Instagram, just kind of chatting with folks and trying to find um, other people in, in, the, in the community who who have experienced some of the things I've experienced, um, who also kind of have the same goals and, and um, mindset. So that's the, the first part as well as, um, yeah, I, I worked for uh, Lincoln Hills Cares this past year um, and Lincoln Hills was the historical black recreation site west of the Mississippi for um, middle-class African-American families. And um, people would come to Denver to Five Points to uh, experience jazz festivals and, and kind of the, the renaissance. And then they would take a drive up to the mountains and fish, camp, hike, um, go hunting, kind of all that uh, stuff, all that sort of outdoor recreation. Um, and then this year we, I was able to join the team and um, pretty much what our program consists of, of course this year was on a much smaller scale, but the program consists of um, students and organizations coming up from Denver um, kind of doing that historic drive and then learning how to fish, learning about um, how to build shelter, learning about microbiology, fish ecosystems, animal tracking. We did scavenger hunts. Um, we taught them archery. Um, it's just kind of this uh, very intro level sort of activities or, or games and things like that. So they can see like, hey, like this is a, not only a career path, but this is something that I can do for fun. Um, and so a lot of the students when they left would be like, oh yeah, I was here last year, or I would love to come back next year, or oh, I remember this from last year, or um, I'm thinking about going to college to do natural resource management or, or be a wildlife biologist. So um, the job was, was really, really rewarding um, and just fun to, to be out in nature and, and share my um, common, just share my, my interest and in, in love with the outdoors, so. And, um can you tell us a little bit more about Lincoln Hills? Just give us a little background to, to that historic location and what it, why it might be sort of culturally significant to people of color. Yeah, I mean, like I like I kind of touched on, it was the uh, only black resort um, for black people for African Americans west of the Mississippi. Um, so it was it was like a vacation. It was like black people's Aspen. Like that's what <laughs> that's exactly what it was. So people would like drive from all around the country to to go fish and 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 beautiful trout streams and go hiking and camping and it was a safe haven um which uh during you know times of segregations in the 60s and the 50s and um it was it was a safe haven for people to feel comfortable just enjoy the outdoors like uh same as same as today so um yeah and and it's a, it's a beautiful spot and a lot of the land is still up there and a lot of the um, buildings and 
uh, historical signs are still up there. So it's a it's a little it's a little moment of history of of um, black people in the natural resource. And to be honest, I did not know anything about it until I applied for the position. So it's, <laughs> and I I grew up in Denver. I've lived in Colorado my whole life, and so it's just sort of kind of sort of that thing of like like you were saying earlier, like there are people of color in natural resources and outdoor recreation, hmm. but because that light was never shown or shine on that piece of history, American Colorado history. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't know about it until recently. So, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, I, it, I, I, it goes without saying, like I was saying earlier, there's a lot of, there's a lot of historical connections to conservation in, in groups of color, but it's kind of a story that just isn't really well known. And it's, it's probably something that would, you know, behoove any, you know, conservationist or someone who's looking to create greater outreach with communities of color to really spend some time understanding these stories. And um, for me, it's been an education as well. This is not something that um, even honestly, in the first two or three years of my time at TU that I was made, you know, that I became aware of, I had to go out and seek this information out. You know, I had to find out what were, you know, what were the issues, you know, to people of color and our natural environment? What are the things that really matter? You know, and I, I found that two things. One was, it was very regional, hyper, hyper regional. So obviously, if you live in the Pacific Northwest along, for example, say the Columbia River, <laughs> you know, your life is, um, uh, and the cultural history there, as well as, you know, some of the, the everyday lived life there has a lot to do with that river and the numerous dams that are along it. And it has an impact on the ecology. It has an impact on the sort of social fabric of those communities, specifically indigenous communities um, and the culture. But if you grow up in Southeast Florida, you know, you're not likely to, 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 to care about those kinds of environments, but you might care heavily, you might care about the Everglades or, or something else. So I found out that was, you know, conservation is always hyper-local and hyper-regional. And so part of it is understanding you know, for communities of color and black people, what's in their, their backyard that connects them to a legacy or a history of conservation and, and connection to the natu natural resources and then tapping, that, tapping into that. And I sort of would like to ask a question of Howard, since you know, since you've been working in all across Colorado, if you come across um, conservation projects or um, conservation issues that you would find are particularly important um, to communities of color uh, in the color in Colorado um, and maybe have a connection to our cold water fisheries anything that might be specific and and then if just you can't think of a specific example just to kind of take it up to the macro level what are the kinds of aquatic conservation issues that you think are going to be important to communities of color? Yeah, it's, it's, I don't have a good, like, you know, specific single bent or thing I can place a finger on for that um, with you. But to me, I think some of the bigger things that in my work, you know, in, in my various roles with the agency, things that's in, that are important that come up is people, um, particularly people, you know, color are looking for, um, if they're getting into this, they want to make sure it's safe. They want to make sure their kids are going to be safe. And they want something that's going to be, you know, that that's, that's easy access. That's, that's um, an easy first step, I guess, you know, like, I feel like sometimes in our agency, you know, we're like, okay, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and let's take these people out and let's go hunting with them. It's like, whoa, that's a big step, you know, like, or let's go hike to this Alpine Lake and let's go catch, <laughs> you know, cutthroats at 14,000 feet. Whoa. You know, how about we go to the local pond that's around the corner from their house and see if we can get some bluegills. Hmm. Like, you know, that, that something along those lines of, of like shifting that I find that, you know, um, a lot of times in, and I think this is across the bar, breaks all, 
you know, kind of racial ethnic lines, mm-hmm. um, especially in your very urban communities, you know, Colorado, Denver, for example, last numbers I heard 80% of the youth in Denver have not been west of Golden. So they've not been in the mountains. Mm-hmm. They live here. They look at them every day, but mm-hmm. they've not been in them. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like a lot of the time, the connections um, in your urban settings are much closer to home. It's that garden plot they have in their backyard. It's that local plot. It's that empty field that they saw a snake in. It's, you know, some of these kind of things are where some of those con- early connections start. And so I think our agency, you know, or organizations, groups, like finding ways to, you know, start that process, that engagement there of this, this is what's close. Here's some things that are nearby. Um, you don't need to, to buy a lot of gear. You don't need to travel a long way. There's opportunities and things that are close by you that we can do. Because again, it, it sells itself. We get them into enjoying that a few times and doing that. Then they want to they wanna branch out, right? And there's this natural progression that kind of happens, um, you know, particularly in angling. And it's real interesting, you know, to see it happen where people are like, well, I'm just kind of trying it. I'm just kind of doing it. I really like doing it. I'm starting to find people that are interested in it, you know, and right there's like a key step. If they're not finding other people and more than likely people that they associate with, you know, they see themselves with, or they could see themselves as, um, there's a, there's a breakdown. There's no, they, they don't take that step to it becoming part of their identity. Maybe mm-hmm. it's something that they just do every now and then, but it doesn't necessarily become become a part of their identity. So, you know, I, I think some of these things that I've seen in some of these small towns and small communities where I've seen success on, you know, with different officers or different parks or stuff is providing that just kind of local access, that that point, that that entry point, you mm-hmm. know, is a, a, a close starting point where people can really try to engage and, and just start to explore some of that. Um, you know, it might be a bit much to, to take people out and you would be surprised you know, the people, I, I was lucky enough, um, a very story similar to yours, I was lucky enough, we were doing these articles for, for a magazine, and I got to take Malik Jackson with the, when he was with the Broncos out fishing. And so we went up into the, just just out of, um, and Lair the Bear on Bear Creek, I mean, just out 470, we're still in town, right? And so we get him and suited up in waders, and we're out, and we're, I got the fly rod, I got a little indicator on there. And, um, you know, we try one spot, he doesn't catch anything. And he's very, very nervous. You can just tell he's, just, he's incredibly nervous to be there. And so like, we're standing next to him, we're fishing and he casts out. And I'm like, now if that, that indicator moves, stops, goes down, it does anything, but what it's doing right there, you set the hook. Right. And he's like, okay. And like, I got him into a prime spot and I'm like, it's going to be right here. First cast, you know, sure enough, he lobs it out there. It drifts through the indicator stops. I go there. And he goes, ha! And he like screamed and he, <laughs> like, in his, in his scream, he actually jerked his hand and set the hook, realized he had a fish on it, put the rod in my chest and dropped it. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no. picked it back up, gave it back to him. Like, no, 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 that's your fish. And, you know, he was all smiles, just like you were talking about, enjoyed yeah. it. It was amazing and stuff, but it was just really incredible to see like, you know, that he, he, and talking with him afterwards, he was like, I felt like we were, you know, in the wilds of middle of nowhere. And it was really an urban park, but just outside of Denver in enough of a canyon, you couldn't see the city or any of that kind of stuff. So, you know, finding those things that are close or you can, they they can, communities that maybe don't have all the means to get to everywhere can get to and start to enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I I think um, you mentioned Howard, some of the um, the challenges that 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 are kind of related with getting um, uh, people into sort of fishing. But let's you know, if we put fishing aside for a second and just sort of think about the larger role of conservation in these fisheries, and this is really a question for Elon and Emma as well for all of you. What else? Uh, you know, what other reasons, (laughs) if you will, right, are there for um, uh, people of color and and, and indigenous people and black people in forging a connection with, you know, a cold water fishery around them, you know, a river, a stream, you know, what could you imagine 
if you will, might be other ways in which um, they may um, connect to those resources. Um, for, for me, it, it kind of goes back to something that I said at the very beginning of our conversation, which is to say, you know, a polluted river, you know, is more likely to be, you know, in an environment where people of color are, right? It's just, you know, it just comes down to that disproportionate and systemic racism that produces those kinds of effects. But I, I kind of wonder if you guys have any thoughts about that, you know, um, and it obviously, you know, it's a, it's sort of a hypothetical, but just be curious your thoughts. Yeah, I, I, I think, I think it's, you step aside from the, the fishing aspect and that kind of stuff. There's a real mental and physical restorative health that comes from being outside. Um, group after group after group, medical study after medical study has shown it, documented it, right? We, we, we find that kind of health and connection and um, that comes from it. And, and I think that is really where, mm. There, there's, there's opportunity there. If mm -hmm. you can get people to, to be in it, to engage in it a little bit, some way, get their feet wet, get their hands dirty, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of take it in to, to, the, to their being, not just it's mm -hmm. over there, it's a thing over there somewhere, but actually they're in it and take it into their being a little bit, that that's going to be what's going to kind of set that stage for, for them to be like, okay, that that's over there. And then, you know what, I never, I, now I know it's there. Now I see maybe this or that, that's, that ain't cool about how that's being treated, handled or, or taken care of. Mm -hmm. I, I want that to be better. And, you know, there, there it is. You start having that kind of, you know, buy-in, I guess mm -hmm. is the word for it of, you know, they're feeling it's part of, part of them now, you know, that this is, this is now, this is their place. Right. So this is something yeah. that they're going to care about, you know, and, and I think a lot of groups, you know, a lot of people too, sometimes, you know what, they may not want to then themselves, they may not want to fish or any that, but they want to make sure that their kids or their nieces or their nephews or whoever have an opportunity to see and enjoy whatever that is as well. Mm. Yeah. And I'll call that, I'll, I'll echo off of a uh, Howard and the mental health aspect and and kind of just getting outside and feeling like you said refreshed like breathing fresh air and you know the the sound of the water rushing and kind of help your thoughts or help you kind of decipher and think about things at least for me that's what i've um gotten out of it and have shared moments like that with with people i'm um, also think like looking at the the small things it's you know we're so busy in our day-to-day -day lives, going from school to work to the next place to the next meeting or whatever. Um, I think fishing and, and being on nature, you start noticing like the little details of maybe your fly or your insects or um, stuff about yourself or just stuff about your, your surroundings. So I think it's, it kind of makes you feel small, but opens your eyes to, to a lot of things and, and puts things in perspective. So yeah, I, I, I agree with Howard on, on all that So. Um, those are really, thank you for that, guys. Those, that's very beautiful. And I think also a, a good reminder too, that, you know, the connection, there are many different ways to, to, to find that connection to, to the natural world, but also talking about why and, and what are those benefits of finding those connections, which could be a way forward. Um, a few months ago, several months ago, before um, the pandemic hit, I sat down and had lunch with Daniel Morgan um, from Project Healing Waters. And most people don't know Project Healing Waters started right here in um, Washington DC area um, as a project out of Walter Reed Hospital. Um, there's been an, um, an interesting uh, cross-pollination between Project Healing Waters and organizations like Trout Unlimited. Um, because of its use of fishing as a um, therapeutic, um, uh, therapeutic recreation. Um, and um, one thing that Daniel shared with me, which I thought was really a powerful insight into his organization, 
he said that, you know, we don't go out and chest beat about it or advertise about it, but, you know, our organization is one of the most diverse outdoor organizations in the world, you know, and it's simply because the community where we draw our members from is our nation's armed forces, which is by its very definition now, one of the most diverse, um, you know, organizations in the, in, in, in the United States. And so he's like, we are regularly connecting with Hispanics, the Latinx community, Asian Americans, African Americans, um, and indigenous people um, and working with them through their outings and through their activities. He said, but we don't, you know, we aren't seen as a, a source for um, the next conservationist. <laughs> you know, he said, which is kind of silly and we should change that. And I said, yeah, we should change that, <laughs> you know. Um, but I think that um, um, it's a reminder that there are a lot of ways, I think, to connect to the natural world and then naturally and hopefully, you know, the opportunity to become an advocate for it in many ways is there. I'm also reminded, Howard, by what you said in terms of getting your hands dirty, right? And in the water and being in the water and having that connection and what that does for you. I think that's very much also um, one of those opportunities and one of those things that sells itself. If you can get them in the water or if you can get them at the riverbank and you can get them exploring the ecology, um, creating those opportunities is just critical. So. Um, any, of you that are, any of you that are parents will know, right? The easiest yeah. days of parenting that you'll ever have are those days when you take your kids outside. Right? <laughs> they're not fighting over this or that. They're not fired up about something else. They're just, you know, they're muddy, they're dirty, they're having fun, they're playing outside. They're just, it's easy, easy parenting. Absolutely. So let me throw this one at Emma because I do think it's a relation, you know, it's a, one of the challenges of, of, of um, that I think your generation, Emma, um, can appreciate, which is, you know, the notion of, um, I guess, you know, getting outside and, and being active outdoors. Um, what do you, what, what's your perspective on, um, how and why you think, you know, your peers would want to even get outside and create that connection? And, and do you have any thoughts or examples, maybe stories about, friends or family members in, 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 um, of your age that have, have done that and found their connection. Yeah, so in addition to what Howard and Neilan said, uh, mental health is a big aspect of it. And not even in the fishing world, like we've gone more general, like hiking, um, camping, that's been a great way for people my age to get outside and to forge that connection. I think now, in a lot of the youth um, and people younger than I am are concerned with environment, uh, the, the state of the environment. Um, so we have like, you know, a, a century that has, is being affected by the climate crisis. And that is looming over our heads as we approach the election and as we approach growing up in a world where we have to deal with that as adults. Um, and I think that that is another kind of so what and another reason for us to forge that connection. Um, again, we hear that a lot in terms of conservationists involved with CTU who have um, that common ground of fishing is my front door to conservation. And I think that will start to change in this coming decade and this coming century where we start to see um, perhaps air quality and access to clean water um, and um, minorities being directly in, impacted by that. I think because of that, you will start to see youth be more involved and want to get more involved. And I think that we won't have to go far to ask people to engage in the outdoors because they will start to see the impacts of it. Um, and I think that that is a big topic for college age students especially with, um, you know, teenagers turning 18 and 21 and becoming adults and being able to vote and have a say in terms of what they can do, especially with what they can do and be involved with um, and what groups they can be involved with. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question per se, but I think, um, 
looking at a grand scheme of like um, forecasting how we can get people involved, people will start to come um, and look for what's already in place. And we're right at the beginning of, um, like I said, a century where it will just, our population will become more and more diverse. And um, if we don't get people involved now, our kind of big so what of why we need to center BIPOC um, communities now is because they will be affected first and very harshly affected. Um, and um, they will be in the future the majority of people who decide what happens to our national parks and our public lands because it will be a more diverse uh, population. So that being said, I think that kind of is a big so what to why we should care about <laughs> this. <laughs> so thank you for that. Amen. <laughs> um, that no, that's very insightful and um, really appreciate that 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 thought. I mean, it, it, communities of color and our you know the um, our young people are going to be inheriting these these challenges and these problems, and uh, it really does you know sort of to me kind of light a match under me to be thinking about uh, you know my daughter and thinking about the world that she's going to inherit and. The environment that she's going to inherit and that you know because she is a um, african-american uh, korean american she is more likely to be you know um, impacted by uh, uh you know the uh, poor air quality poor water quality than, than than other groups of people um and so we think about you know the, ch the tasks ahead of us for co cold water conservation yes in the end you know you know from a species-based um sort of protectionist point of view, you know, there's a sort of like the butterfly effect, you know, protecting a brook trout should have an impact downstream. Um, but if the community downstream, downstream doesn't know about it and is not engaged in that process, then how big of that effect can it actually be? So that's a, that's a really powerful observation. Um, Emma, thank you for that. Um, so we're gonna, you know, looking at our time, I, I would like to make sure that we have a, a, a little bit of time if, if folks want to ask questions, they can put those questions, uh, type them right into the chat box, um, and we'll, we will take the questions and then pass them on uh, to, to, to everyone else. Um, so feel free to hop right in and put those questions there, and we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, bearing in mind, um, we'll probably go for maybe another 10 minutes if the panelists allow. Okay, so first of all, this is a question from Barbara. Clean water is of value to everyone. Can TU connect to BIPOC communities through advocacy? And what education components would complement that? Um, so just to um, start that part of that conversation and, and sort of thinking about that, of course, clean water is of value to everyone. And I think um, one of the things that really strikes me about an organization like Trout Unlimited is, you know, if you think back to, you know, 50, 60 years ago when TU was founded uh, on the banks of the Asabo River in Michigan, you know, obviously it was, a, you know, an attempt to kind of, you know, um, protect some waters for some anglers as well as, you know, restore some of those waters for fishing. But, you know, 60 years later, just down the river is Flint, Michigan, which has some of the worst water quality <laughs> in the country, right? Um, and obviously the water uh, flowing into the, uh, the basin around Flint comes from some of the, uh, the areas that um, TU in Michigan is trying to protect. And you kind of wonder about the dynamic of those things, right? How can you have pristine blue ribbon trout waters, a stone's throw away from a place that has the poorest water quality in the world with disproportionately, you know, people of color being impacted by that? Um, Obviously, you know, in the last 10 years or so, there's been an outcry for greater advocacy around improving the water quality in a place like Flint, Michigan, but it's about the people, right? It's about improving the water quality for the people. And, you know, species-based organizations like TU, which are focused on the trout, aren't necessarily going to be connecting the dots and thinking about the people, right? So when we talk about clean water is of value to everyone, I think it's thinking maybe bigger you know, I wonder if the um, panelists have any thoughts about that. 
sure um it yeah it is it is a bigger a bigger topic and i think that's in and of itself is its strength i think that's where you get to it right that whether people are interested in, in trout or a, a species of fish or something else is, is you know very small granular scale where water you know <laughs> we all need water um right. we all and i think all of us agree you know that everybody should have access to good water, whether that's to play in, to drink, or for for whatever else. And so I, I think those common common things can be can be found right there. Um, you know, and, and can we connect through advocacy with that? Absolutely. I think that's I think that's key. I think the big part of that is to that you have to. This takes everybody, right? So. Um, I've heard many people talk on this, on this subject, and this isn't a just simple, you know, math equation. Um, everybody has a role in this, regardless of their age, regardless of their gender, regardless of their ethnicity, they have a role. And it's until we are all together advocating together, do we really see those major, major changes happening. So another question here from uh, Dan Zimmer. Um, I wonder if you and the panelists can comment on positive actions that we are seeing in centering, connecting BIPOC communities with the outdoors. Um, Elon, I think this is one that you may have some direct experience with considering your work with Lincoln Hills Cares. I think you're muted, Elon. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Perfect. Uh, good. I said, good question. Uh, thanks for asking, asking it. Um, I think there are a lot of positive actions, even if um, it's not immediately seen. I think there's a lot of positive actions, not only um, for uh, showing representation in conservation, uh, not just in fishing, but in conservation in general, but also in terms of conservation in general. So because of like you said, Joel, um, because you said um, like Flint, Michigan and their their lack of healthy, clean drinking water that I, every human deserves. Um, you're seeing people who are much more advocates for natural resource management, for um, clean water, clean water um, and water quality. Um, and I think showing uh, more uh, centering and, and being around uh, BIPOC people for conservation I'll say it like this, it's easier to get 100,000 signatures to protect a park or a lake or a river um, if the entire community, if the entire city knows about it, rather than trying to get 100,000 signatures and just a small population of people who benefit from fly fishing know about it. So um, I think it is important for conservation to, to, to make it um, more accessible for people to learn about. Um, no, and also it makes it a lot easier to protect. So that's that's the benefits that I'm seeing from it because conservation is much more now, especially with the climate change effects and um, here in Colorado with the fires as well as California, people are saying like, oh, this is this is like a real thing that can like destroy my life. So mm. um <clears throat> Dan asks, what can TU do to be better allies for the BIPOC community? Um, so just to sort of start to, to answer that question, I think one of the, um, you know, one of the key things I think we should recognize is first of all, at the national level, at the very least, you know, this is a conversation that I think the organization has really begun to have in earnest. Um, and, but at the grassroots level and at the regional level, level and at the local level, I think many of the things that we talked about today um, are potential strategies, maybe for recruitment. But there also has to be an acknowledgement that there are um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color already within the organization, <laughs> within Trout Unlimited. And I think it begins with understanding that, um, you know, ultimately, um, looking at, you know, looking in the mirror and looking at the organization and looking at the makeup of your own organizations and, and asking yourselves, you know, um, what do these, uh, what do these members, how do these members feel? Um, 
how do these members, um, um, what are their opinions um, and what are their thoughts about engaging with your local community um, of black indigenous and people of color. I think that's a great place to start. And then um, secondly, I think as we think about um, the broader universe of conservation, um, I think it's probably safe to say that, you know, becoming a better ally starts with finding ways to connect with um, conservation organizations that already have inroads with or are largely made up of um, uh, black indigenous and people of color, even if it's outside of some of the specific purview of Trout Unlimited. Partly creating and forging coalitions and alliances is one of the great strengths of the organization. And that's where I would encourage um, uh, any uh, chapter or state organization to start. And that's my, that's my point of view on it. But um, you know, Emma, if you have an, another thought based on your experience or um, any, of you, any of the other panelists, please, please share that. All right. Moving can you on. Repeat that? Sorry, can you repeat that? Because I wanted to say something and I totally oh. lost my idea. <laughs> I'm sorry. I probably weren't I was rambling too much anyway. Um, so here's the question uh, from uh, Dan. What can TU do to be better allies for the BIPOC community? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, we talked about it briefly before, but um, making like, like Howard mentioned it, um, having events that are safe for families and families have their kids go to and just very accessible. Um, I was going to say earlier on that when we work with kids in Denver, they totally look at the mountains and uh, they look at the west and just the skyline of of the mountains that we love and are so familiar with. And they're like, oh my gosh, we can go there. Like, I didn't know that that was a place that I even had access to, which we, I think, take it for granted. So just, I think awareness and introducing people to the fact that like, not just their local places are accessible, but they also can take their family up for a picnic in Clear Creek and experience that. Um, I think that's that's where I see a lot of importance in, in awareness. So, and being an ally. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, well, you know, with that being said, I think it's time to kind of wrap up our conversation for the, this evening. Um, I just want to take a moment to say thank you to our panelists for joining us and giving us um, their time um, and their, their valuable insights. Um, so thank you to Emma Brown. Uh, thank you very much to Howard Horton. And thank you very much, Elon Stripling. We really, really appreciate your participation. Um, I will remind all of our participants that these are your local, these are local Coloradans who are actively involved in conservation um, and doing really wonderful things. Um, please reach out to them uh, and connect with them uh, as you will. And then also I'd like to say thank you to Annie for making sure that we ran a really tight ship uh, with this Zoom. Uh, as well as to David Nickham for inviting uh, me and these panelists on to have this conversation with you today. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much as well to all of you um, who took your evenings to um, zoom in and join us for this discussion. We had on average anywhere between 20 or 30 um, different participants over the course of the conversation. I really appreciate all of your questions. Um, if you visit the chat box there, and just sort of scan through it, you will find links uh, that are potential resources for you uh, related to the conversation tonight. And um, I will also uh, throw out there, please feel free to e email me if you have any questions or thoughts, perhaps I can help direct you um, to other resources as you start to think about how you can center um, uh, BIPOC voices as part of your communities and conservation. Thank you very much. And I wish everyone have a very good uh, rest of the evening and um, please stay safe and be careful out there, wear your mask, wash your hands and vote. All right, take care everybody. Thanks Joel, thanks for moderating. <laughs>